Good morning, everybody. This is the Macro Church of Christ Sunday Isaiah study. We're going to be talking about the author today. Uh, before we get started, let's uh, have a word of prayer, and Chad will lead us in that prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for allowing us to be here to worship you and to study your word. We're thankful for Mike for preparing the material. We ask that also, Lord, that you be with those mentioned that have had surgeries and are not feeling well. We're thankful for your son, Jesus, and we ask for forgiveness of our sins. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let me make sure this volume is up on here just to make sure we get this properly. Okay. It was nice and loud in the office. It was nice and loud in the office. Yeah, that's because that's nice and loud. But uh, sometimes I'm not sure how the recording comes out. All right, so, so we're in Isaiah. If you have your book, uh, we're dealing with the, uh, with the author, and we're looking at some. By the way, I had a bunch of other stuff I wanted to tell you, uh, kind of for background material for the book of Isaiah, but I, I decided that I'll just wait, and when we come across each one of those, um, uh, each one of those metaphors, that we'll spend some time talking about it and looking at it. So right now, what we want to do today is we want to talk a little bit about uh, Isaiah, and we want to talk about the fact that he's the author of the book, and we're going to be looking at some charts and other things as we go through some uh, some history. Uh, so you should be, I believe this is page, what page is this in your notes? Uh, well, page four says some thoughts about the author. That's it. All right. So it's your page four is what you, sh what you should have. Um, and so as you take a look at that, it says, like Bill pointed out, some thoughts about the author of the book. Uh, of course, we know his name. His name is Isaiah, uh, uh, Isaiah, and Isaiah means Jehovah is salvation, or Jehovah saves, uh, anything like that. And of course, that certainly reminds us of the fact that uh, why um, God's son had the name that he had. What, what was God's name? What was Jesus' name? Ah. Jesus. Jesus. That was a good one, right? Like who's buried in Grant's tomb? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and why was Jesus called Jesus? Because he saves. He saves his people from their sins. So Isaiah means Jehovah saves. And in the New Testament, we have Jesus saving us and Jesus being called Savior. So e either, either Jesus is usurping God's position or Jesus is Jehovah uh, just like Jehovah is Jehovah, and so it's, it's, it's their name. Uh, so uh, that's what his name means. Uh, Isaiah, believe it or not, had some children. A lot of times we don't, we don't read or uh, know about the, the uh, domestic life of the prophets. We just simply, they just are simply appear and then kind of disappear for us. But Isaiah had some children. And if you go over here to Isaiah chapter 7, uh, we, we find out that uh, he, he goes up here and has some kids, okay? Um, and um, actually, I want chapter 8, what I want. And uh, actually, here, here in chapter 7 and, and down at verse uh, 14 is where the Lord talks about giving us a sign and that whole section is dealing with that. That's why I have that written down there for you. The whole section is dealing with it. But then in chapter 8, uh, you, you come over here and you notice that, as we pointed out last week, that Isaiah seems to be the fulfillment of that in their, in a uh, more local sense. In Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 1, it says, Then the Lord said to me, Take for yourself a large tablet and write uh, on it in ordinary letters, Swift is the booty, speedy is the prey. And I will take to myself faithful witnesses for testimony, Uriah the priest and uh, Zechariah the son of, uh, of uh, Jebba uh, Rechiah. So I approached the prophetess. Now the prophetess would be his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. And the, the Lord said, name him Meher Shalah Hash Baz. Uh, uh, and he says, for before the boy knows how to cry out, my father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away before the king of Assyria. And so he, he has a uh, son. He has two sons. Uh, he has one son that's called uh, Shira Jashub, and that means pr uh, uh, preservation of the remnant. 
And then the one that we just saw here is God keeps his word in Assyria. And so this, the, the boys' names, as you can tell, they're even used for the purpose of carrying out God's will in the prophet. And so you have uh, those two. And the, this, this one, Mah, Mahir Shalah, Hash, Hashabs, is the one who was under consideration during this period here, right here. Remember that Isaiah wrote under here. Here's when Isaiah wrote. And this is when uh, Rezin and uh, uh, Syria were coming down to fight against, well, they, they fought up here, but they were coming down to fight against uh, God's people down here in Judah. And that's when Isaiah writes this. That's when Isaiah gets this prophecy about a virgin shall be with child. And then he goes into the prophetess and has a child. And by the time the child's three years old, the kings that were up here in the north, they, they get um, expelled. Uh, and so that threat ends. And so even in the naming of its, of its children, uh, you can understand that uh, God was using him as a living uh, parable, you might say, uh, uh, in that. And so it's interesting that, that even his domestic life was being controlled by God as you take a look at him being the prophet. Uh, and then, uh, as we move uh, a little bit uh, more, um, uh, number three says, he was also a, a, a historian histographer or historian of the Judean court. In other words, he, he actually wrote some of the chronicles, uh, and that's why we have the historical parts in the book of Isaiah that we do uh, in Chronicles chapter 26. And uh, by the way, that's 2 Chronicles 26. And down here at verse 22, uh, it says, uh, now the rest of the acts of Isaiah, First to last, the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, has written. So he also recorded some historical information. Uh, there, there's other places where it refers to that in the book of Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah himself talks about the fact that he uh, prophesied or he wrote about the history. And I tell you that the book of Isaiah has a section in it that deals with history in uh, Isaiah chapter 38 um, and 39, uh, there you have Hezekiah's sickness and his recovery. Remember, we, we read that when we went over Chronicles. Uh, and then the uh, envoys to Babylon, we, we read about that when we also covered that. So he's a historian as well. Uh, not only that, but he also, as you might figure, recognized his personal sin. In Isaiah chapter 6, where he says he saw the Lord uh, and he saw the throne of the Lord, uh, it says down here in uh, verse uh, 5, it says, Then I said, Woe is me, for I am, this is Isaiah talking, Woe is me, for I am, uh, I am uh, ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Uh, then one of the seraphims flew to me with burning coal in his hand, uh, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this uh, has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. And so basically, he recognizes his sin, and he recognizes the fact that God is the one who takes away his sin. And that's important for anybody who teaches or preaches God's word. Uh, we need to remember our own faults, our own shortcomings, and so when we approach people, we need to understand that we, just like them, have difficulty with sin and have difficulty with our own problems and our own difficulties that we have so that we can share the message of God with them uh, in a way that will help them rather than in a way that, that hurts them. In uh, Hebrews chapter 5 uh, and verse 1, he says, For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men, in things pertaining to God, in order to offer both gifts and sacrifice for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided, since he himself is also beset with weakness. And because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for sin, for the people, so also for himself. And so he points out in Hebrews chapter 5 that the, that the, 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 the priests of God also need to be individuals who recognize their sin, who recognize their shortcomings, and who recognize that it's only through the offering and the forgiveness of sins that we have in Jesus that we can approach God. 
And, that, and as I pointed out, that's important because if you have the idea that, that you're worthy of uh, the position that God has given us to, then you're going to treat other people uh, with contempt who you don't believe are worthy, who you don't think are good enough. Uh, and so we, we need to understand that none of us are good enough. And so Isaiah recognizes his own, his own sin, his own shortcomings, and that's really important uh, in his preaching of the message, because even though he's dealing with sinful men, he recognizes his own sin. Yes. Hebrews chapter 5, uh, like verses 1 through 3. Mm -hmm. um, all right, not only that, but of course, as you would expect, uh, Isaiah understands his personal human limitations. And he understands that the only reason that he can preach the message that he's preaching is because God is the one who has taken care of him. In Isaiah chapter 8, in verse 1, he says, For thus the Lord spoke to me with mighty power and instructed me not to walk in the ways of this people, saying, You are not to say it is a conspiracy in regard to all that this people call a conspiracy, and you are not to fear what they fear or be in, in dread. It is the Lord of hosts whom you shall regard as holy, and he shall be your fear, and he shall be your dread. Uh, and uh, uh, then he shall become... Uh, then he shall become a sanctuary, uh, but uh, to both the houses of Israel, to, uh, a stone of, to strike and a rock of stumbling and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And so uh, he, he points out and he recognizes that he's limited to the fact of, of what God regards him to do and what God sends him to do in the, in the preaching and the message of the gospel. Uh, the apostle Paul said the same thing. Uh, he said it in uh, Romans chapter 15, uh, when he said that he, he doesn't uh, do more than God has commissioned him to do. Uh, and in doing that, he's recognizing his position as God's servant. Uh, let me see if I can find that for you real fast here. Um, it, it's in Romans 15, and uh, down here at about verse um, 15, he says, but I have written uh, very boldly to you on some points so as to remind you again because of the grace that was given to me of God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Spirit. Therefore, in, in Christ Jesus, I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God. For, uh, for I will not presume to speak of anything except what God has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles. So he points out that, that he recognizes his limits in the message that he preaches, and so does uh, uh, Isaiah um, as he writes to us. Uh, and then you notice the, the historical setting of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 1, in verse 1, he says, The vision of Isaiah the son of Amos concerning Judah and Jerusalem, which he saw during the reigns of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So he speaks about this period here where he's preaching. And so he's preaching under these individuals. He preaches under Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, a little bit of Manasseh. Matter of fact, Manasseh is the one who kills him. Uh, and so you could say that he preached a little bit under there. But that's generally who he preached under. Now, what's interesting is, even though he preached under these kings and he deals mainly with them, he also preaches about the, the fall of Judah. He even preaches about the fact that they're going to go into Babylonian captivity. And he also preaches about the coming of Jesus and the Messiah and what's going to happen when Jesus comes. And the book of Isaiah is quoted a number of times in the New Testament. And Jesus himself quotes from the New Testament. Uh, I'm sorry, from uh, the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah. And, and, and so it's important for us to, to understand the, the historical setting because that's going to help us. Un, that's going to help us understand uh, what it is that Isaiah is saying. And like I said, sometimes that's a little confusing, but generally we can figure it out. And so he preached under three, uh, uh, um, three major kings, and maybe four, depending on if you consider Manasseh as going, uh, 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 being one of the people that he preached under. Although Manasseh killed him. Now, uh, one of the things that I didn't write on your paper that I think is interesting for you to know is that in Isaiah 24, not just Isaiah 24, this is just an example, but in Isaiah 24, you have the fact that he's a poet as well. Um, beginning in verse 7, if you have a Bible that, that shows you um, 
poetry and uh, um, prose, uh, uh, you know, uh, narrative uh, speaking as opposed to, to poetry. Notice that beginning in verse 7, there is a change in the way your Bible looks because that's poetry. And so remember some of the traits of, of Hebrew poetry. Hebrew poetry uh, rhymes how? In thought. It rhymes in thought. Hebrew poetry doesn't rhyme in words because God knew it was going to be translated into various languages. And if you rhyme in, in sound, then you're not going to be able to translate that sound when you translate it into other words. And so the, the Old Testament and the, the book of Psalms and all the poetry that you find, that, that poetry deals with uh, the sounding of or the, the um, rhyming of thought rather than the rhyming of a sound. And so, for example, here in Isaiah 24 and verse 8, he says, The gaiety of the tambourine ceases, the noise of revelers stop, the gaiety of the harp ceases. And, and so basically, basically what you have is you have three times they say the exact same thing, don't they? And, and so that's the poetry. That's the way it works. So he, he was a poet. Matter of fact, some people suggest he was a, a, a very good poet, that the poetry that he wrote was, was better than much of the poetry that you see uh, in the Bible. And so he wrote down, he wrote uh, as a poet, and therefore uh, he wrote some of those things. Matter of fact, uh, Isaiah 53, that we call the suffering servant psalm in, in, in Isaiah 53, that whole section there is written in poetry. And so that's the reason why it kind of sounds like he's repeating himself, because it is. It rhymes in, it rhymes in, in, in word or in thought, not in sound. And so he was a poet. And so I just want you to, to understand that as you read some of it, uh, that, that some of it's going to be written in, in uh, poetic verse as he writes. All right, so uh, let's, let's do a little bit of work as far as the thoughts of the history of the book. And we're going to do that by, first of all, taking a look at chart number 99 that you have in your, in your paper here, or in, in your, I have it somewhere, where is that, where did I put it? Uh, um, yeah, um, page, it's page 13 in your notes, let's see, where is it here? I thought I had it up, I thought I had it up on the video, maybe I, maybe I missed it, nope, it's not. All right, but anyway, on, on, in your booklet, it's down here on page 13, right? All right, of course, mine's different, so let me find mine. Uh, let me find it here. All right, here it is, uh, page 99, or, or chart 99, sorry. Uh, it's, it's the three period of the prophets, and so, so basically, real quickly, this gives you a, an overview, real quick, of this part of the, this part of the, oh wait, no, that's not it, yeah, oh, there it is, uh, all right, so, so here it is, so uh, basically, this gives you an overview, uh, a real big overview of this period here, that you have in here, and so that's what you have over here, all blown up for you. And if you notice, you have the pre-exilic, the exilic, and the post-exilic, and, and exilic just means exiled. So one was before they were exiled, one's when they're exiled, and one's after they're exiled. And this is when most of the prophets wrote that you and I think about and spoke was during this time. There, there were prophets that preached during this time here, but there weren't as many as preached during this time here and this period here. And the reason is because the main work of the prophets. What's the main work of the prophets? They, they speak for God. And so they had to speak for God during this time when Israel and Judah were going off into captivity and weren't doing what they were supposed to do. They spoke for God when they were in uh, exile. And then when they were coming out of exile, God had to speak to his people again. And, and so as you, as you notice this, we have those three periods that, that we refer to here. And when you look at, at uh, Isaiah, he preached during this period here. So Isaiah preaches during the fourth period, of the first period, but he also preaches over here about their captivity, them going off into captivity, and then, of course, many of the prophets preach about the coming of Jesus. And so that's, that's part of where you have to understand that Isaiah is. So as you're reading him, if you understand, if, if you read that, if you understand where he's coming from historically, it, it'll help you as you take a look at, uh, at uh, 
the, his book. Uh, and, and so we, we spent some time looking at that. Uh, let me go back here to where I'm at and uh, find out where I'm at here. Problem is my, my numbers are different than yours, and so I get confused here, okay. All right, uh, and then the uh, next chart that we have that I want you to look at is chart number uh, 102, and chart number 102, uh, it's out of order here. Let's see if I can find it. That's this one. And so, so here you have uh, uh, Isaiah's period blown up. See, this is Isaiah. And so where the other one, you had all three of the different, different groups. This is when Isaiah preaches. And if you notice up here, one of the reasons I like this chart is because you notice up here, it has the kings of Assyria that are going on there. Uh, and then you have here kings of Israel that are going on here. Uh, and, and then down here, uh, you have the kings of Judah. So you have the kings of Judah and the kings of, of Israel uh, down here. And you have the king of Assyria that's up here. And he's going to play an, he's going to play an important part uh, during this time. Now, during the northern kingdom, remember that Isaiah is, is living under, under Judah. He's preaching during Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, and like I said, a little bit of Manasseh. But he's preaching mainly under these three kings. And during that time, up in the land of Assyria, you have uh, Shalmaneser the fifth. Then you have Sargon. Then you have... Uh, uh, the Nacarib, who we're going to deal with as they come down here. Uh, and then over here, uh, it's uh, um, uh, Hosea, during Hosea's time, that the northern kingdom goes into uh, Assyrian captivity. And so that they go into Assyrian captivity. And as they go off into Assyrian captivity, Assyria tries to come down here and also invade the north. And that's when, or the south, and that's when. Uh, Isaiah is writing. So he's, he's writing during that period. Um, and, and then uh, you have chart number 27. Now let's see if I can find chart number 27 up here real quick. There it is right there. All right, so, so here uh, you have chart 27, which is basically a chart of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. And the first thing I want you to notice is that it's, you can divide it in half. Now, this is one way of, of dividing it up. There are other people who divided up a little bit different, but this is chart number 27. But everybody agrees in this, in this section right here that the first four sections, or, or the first section, deals with the judgment of God. Then the second section, beginning at 40 to the end, deals with the comfort of God. And so as you take a look at this, this chart that we're looking at here, uh, divides it into the, the judgment on Judah, and then judgment on, the, on foreign nations, uh, and then warning and promises, and then the historical section, and then you have the re redemption, as, as you begin in chapter 40, to talk about God's comfort, you have uh, redemption here that, that's found in chapter 40 to uh, uh, chapter 48, uh, and, and then you have the redemption provided in 49 through uh, 57, and then from 58 to 66, you have the redemption realized. So a lot of Isaiah's Prophecies have to do with the coming redemption, the promise of redemption, providing redemption, and the realizing of redemption. And so that's one of the reasons why um, um, the authorship of Isaiah is so important, because some people believe that a different guy wrote this section here from here that way. So from chapter 40 on, some other person wrote it. Now, why would they want to say that? Well, they seem contradictory to one another, and that's true. Uh, but I would think it more they're, they're complementary, but nonetheless. I uh, want, want you to think of why is it that some people would not want this to be written by Isaiah, who wrote here? Well, let me ask you. As you look at Isaiah, where would, where would the suffering servant psalm be? It'd be under comfort, right? Matter of fact, it's, it's uh, Isaiah 53. Now, what's Isaiah 53 about? It's suffering servant. Who's that about? Jesus. Now, why, why wouldn't some people want that story about Jesus to be written over here, but they say it's written by somebody else who comes later? Possibly 
because then the prophecy wouldn't be true. So the, the, the reason that some people believe that this section isn't written by Isaiah is because of the prophecies and because of the, uh, the accuracy of the prophecies. And so they say Isaiah couldn't have written that stuff. Somebody had to write it later. So they say somebody wrote it later after it happened over here. And after these things happened, then somebody else came and filled in this section here that we have. And, and so they say a different person wrote this than wrote the, fir than wrote the first half. Okay? And the, the reason for that is because they don't want you to believe in the prophecies of God. And so the best thing to do is to tell you that somebody else wrote that at a different time. And so they call this guy Isaiah, Isaiah 2, and they call this over here Isaiah 1. So Isaiah 1 wrote all the stuff in the Old Testament, and then Isaiah 2 came along, and he wrote the stuff in the New Testament that happened. And the reason he knew about it and the reason that it, it was so accurate was because he wrote it basically after it all happened. Because they don't believe in miracles. They don't believe in the uh, inspiration of the scriptures. That's also one of the other reasons is because he, uh, uh, Isaiah talks about the fact that they're going to go off into Babylonian captivity and they're going to come out of Babylonian captivity and, and, and they're going to meet the Messiah. And so as a result of that, they say this is written after they come out of captivity and not before. And so that's one of the reasons why why uh, the authorship of Isaiah is so important. And we'll get into that as we go through, go through the text itself, and we'll be looking at those kinds of things that are in there. Uh, and, and so basically, this is just a breakup of, of, um, uh, um, of the outline of Isaiah in chart form, and that's what you have here. So the first section is going to deal with judgments of God, and the second section is going to deal with the comforts of God. Now, as you take a look at this, I want you to notice that the first thing he starts off with is the judgment on Judah, and prophecies of Judah. Now, even though chapter 36 begins the historical section, he starts over here, even before he brings, he brings prophecies on the nations that deal with, with destruction of them, why in the world would he start off with Judah? Why not start off with the nations? Okay, the promise of the Messiah was to come through Judah. That's true. But, but he's talking here about the judgment that comes on Judah. Because the Bible says that judgment starts with the house of God. That's where judgment starts. Judgment starts with the house of God. Judgment doesn't start with the wicked people. Judgment starts with the house of God. He starts off with the house of God. And so that's the reason why you have Judah... Uh, uh, the, the judgment on Judah being prophesied here, because it's not like God says, well, I have a different standard for the nations than I do for Judah. It's the same standard. So if Judah doesn't measure up, what would make the nations think that they're going to measure up? If they're not doing, if they're doing the same thing that God condemned Judah for, why would the nations assume that they're going to be okay if God condemned his own people for the activity that they're doing? Then this makes a whole lot of sense here then. What this tells us is judgment starts with Judah, and then uh, after God tells, tells us that he's going he, he's to bring judgment on Judah, his own people, because they're not doing what's right, he, Isaiah then moves over to the foreign gods, uh, or, the, or to the foreign nations, and says, you too are going to uh, uh, come under God's judgment, even though you're following other gods, and you think they're the ones you follow, God's bringing judgment on you, and so therefore he gives them warnings, and he gives them promises, and then he sticks in the historical context that indicates why it is exactly that this judgment is coming on the children of Israel. And then for the whole group of people, for the Gentiles and the Jews, we then have chapter 40 all the way to chapter 66 that talks about God's compassion and his kindness in trying to bring them back. And so that kind of gives you an outline of the book of Isaiah and hopefully helps you uh, understand those things that Isaiah is writing about so that we can kind of keep the, the genre of the book and the style of the book uh, in, in kind of a logical understanding of why it was written the way it was written. It wasn't just pieced together and just thrown together. There was a reason for the, for the reason it was written the way it was. And though as we read it, sometimes we get confused, we have to remember that all books in the, New Test in the Old and New Testament were written for a certain purpose. And therefore, they take those events that happen and they write them in the sequence in which they want so that they can convey the message that they want. And remember, 
uh, I believe that this 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 um, uh, outline wasn't something that man decided. It was some God decided. God was the one who pinned this. God was the one who put it in this structure. God was the one who, who wrote it the way he wrote it and put it in the order in which he, he wrote it as far as the books are concerned. And so I'd suggest to you that understanding this is just as important as understanding anything else about the book of Isaiah. Because if you understand that, then it'll help you see the logical sequences as Isaiah, as Isaiah writes and as he talks about the things that he's talking about. All right. Um, so uh, let's get into a little bit here, if we can, on some thoughts about the message of the book. And you might say, well, I thought we already had the message of the book. Well, we do. But uh, here's what I want you to understand. Number one, uh, it fits into the whole of the Bible message. God's trying to pick out a people for his own possession. That's what the book of Isaiah is about. God's trying to pick out a people. He's always tried to pick out a people over here. Matter of fact, why did he create Adam and Eve? And don't tell me because he wanted to. To populate the earth, okay? But he had animals to populate the earth. So he just put man here so man would take care of the earth? Animals were here. So they have control over them. So he needed somebody to control the earth. He made him in his image. God says, I want somebody like me. I want somebody like me, God says. Just like, just like when you have children, you try to raise them to be like you. God says, I'm creating, I'm creating these creatures, and I want them to be like me. That's the reason why God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. He wants people like him. So from the very beginning, God's intention was for us to be like God. Now, what's really interesting is what was it that Satan told, uh, uh, told Adam and Eve that God didn't want them to be? Like him. Satan said, God doesn't want you to be like him. God says, that's why I made you was to be like me. I made you to be like me. Now, if you think being like God means you have, you have all power and you can destroy things, then you misunderstand God. You misunderstand the power of God. You misunderstand what he does. But we're designed to be like him. God has tried to call out a people for himself from the very beginning of creation. God wants a people to serve him. God wants a people who love him. And so uh, uh, he had to destroy the entire world with, with Noah, right? He destroyed the whole world and started over again, still trying to find a people for himself. The people went off into, into idolatry again after he delivered them uh, 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 after the flood. They went off into idolatry until God said, OK, I'm going to call Abraham. And I'm going to call Abraham, and I'm going to have, tell Abraham that his family is going to be the family I'm going to pick. And so he picks Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and, and the 12 sons of Jacob become the 12 tribes of Israel. And he's trying to get a people for himself. That's what God has always been trying to do, and that's part of what the book of Isaiah is telling us. The book of Isaiah is telling us the same thing, that God has always been trying to get a people for himself. He brings judgment on Judah because they're not like him. That's why he brings judgment on them. They weren't doing what God would do. And we're going to notice that as we get into the first chapter. Uh, and the nations are worse. And so he can't get people out of them until the redemption comes and the world figures out that God actually loves them and wants them to be like them. Uh, and then God's going to uh, get a group of people for himself. So that's one of the things that, that you have. Now, uh, uh, secondly, on your paper there, as, you're, as you take a look, it says uh, the single message, uh, message is proclaimed in the Old Testament at different times to different generations of people living under different sets of circumstances and having different needs uh, to be met. So in other words, God was looking for a group of people with Adam and Eve. He was looking for a group of, uh, of people after Adam and Eve sinned. He was trying to get a group of people. Remember, he got Enoch and he got uh, um, uh, Abel, right? Then the world became wicked. And then he picks out Abraham, and not all of Abraham's family was faithful, so he calls Isaac, and from Isaac he calls Jacob, and from Jacob he calls the 12 tribes, and those 12 tribes were who he picked, but some of them weren't faithful, and so God is trying to pick out these people for himself uh, in order to be able to have people, uh, but, there, but there are certain different circumstances during all these people, during all this time. The circumstances of Adam and Eve were different than the circumstances uh, in Noah's day. Circumstances during Abraham's 
uh, time were different than our, our time over here. The circumstances of Israel are different than our circumstances over here, but yet God is still trying to do the same thing. He's trying to bring about a people for himself. And maybe that helps us understand why in here, when, when Jesus was here, one of the people that he made efforts to meet was the woman at the well. Well, why out of all the people in Israel did Jesus make opportunity to meet the woman at the well? And I believe he made opportunity to do that. He could have just passed on by and sat somewhere else, but he wanted to meet her. Why would he want to meet her? To show that his love extends to people who are in different circumstances. The Jewish community thought God was exclusively theirs. God's been trying to teach all the whole world that all the nations belong to him, which is why he brings judgment on the nations. I can't bring judgment on something that doesn't belong to me. I can only bring judgment on what belongs to me. I can only decide to do with what belongs to me what I want to with it. And so therefore, when he brings about this judgment on the nations, God's telling the nations, not just that he's bringing judgment on them, but he loved them and they belonged to him and they should have listened to him. That's what he's telling them in, in, in all of this uh, as he, he does that. All right, so we're going to have to stop there. We'll uh, uh, start with number three and hopefully get into the text next week uh, as we um, strive to learn some things about Isaiah. Uh, any questions or thoughts before we end? All right, let's have a, a prayer. Father in heaven, we're just so thankful for Isaiah. We're thankful that you have preserved his writings for us so that we might know not only about him, not only who he is and, and what he went through, but also, Father, the message that he has for us so that we can understand that you do care about us, that uh, you are looking for a, a people for your own possession. And we thank you, Father, for helping us understand how that's going to happen. We praise you and thank you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.